Okay, hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. This is Kinsella on Liberty. I don't know which episode number it is. You can find out uh, by looking at the podcast, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Um, today I'm going to talk with Matt Sands, and usually everyone that listens to this knows usually this is just uh, me appearing on other people's podcasts, but on occasion I do an original discussion or something. And so Matt Sands is here with us today, and we're going to talk about some libertarian theory issues. Matt, why don't you say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, Stefan. Hi, everybody who's listening. Uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I uh, run a project called The Nations of Sanity, um, which is a representation of voluntarism as I see it. Um, and presents the idea of establishing the non-aggression principle as the terms of peace as the way to a free society. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to introduce myself. <laughs> cool. Well, so you and I uh, talked previously about your project, and um, and then you and I are both talking to uh, Mark Victor about his somewhat related uh, uh, life, liberty, what is it? Live and Live and Let Live project. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations around uh, our common grounds and our disagreements and things like that. And so you and I ended up talking about contract theory, property theory, and things like that. And um, you thought it might be good to have a talk about some of that. So why don't you take it from there? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it kind of started when you challenged me on the assertion that contract violation, when I said that contract violations were NAP violations. Um, and when you sort of challenged me on that assertion, I, at first I was kind of like, well, surely they are, because I could think of many examples when a non-aggression principle violation had occurred let's say facilitated through a contract violation like say comes fraud or theft or something like that that involved the contract violation but um and this is where i want to kind of delve into this a little bit more with you to kind of help uh my own understanding of where you're coming from but if i if i if i understand you correctly and this is where i think i kind of come around to your thinking on it is i realize that it's not the contract itself or sorry the contract violation itself that is a non-aggression principle violation, even in the instances where the non-aggression principle violation is involved, like a theft or a fraud, the theft or the fraud is itself a non-aggression principle violation. The contract violation may be evidence of that theft and fraud, you know, like, for example, um, if I made a contract to sell you my car and then didn't give you my car, that's evidence that I've stolen what is rightfully your car because I've confirmed the ownership right. transferation to you and something like that. So for, so that's why initially I was kind of resistant to your pushback that NAP violations were, sorry, that contract violations were not NAP violations. Um, but then when I thought about it more, I realised um no actually they're not that violations although they can often be evidence of or you know they can be involved in that violations either being evidence of a that violation or facilitating a that violation um but the contract itself isn't necessarily that violation and that kind of led me to think more deeply about what a contract really is and uh, my kind of briefest overview of my understanding is i suppose it's a formalized promise um, and as self-owning individuals, we have the right to make those promises, and we also have the right to break those promises. And, and while um, there may be consequences to that, it doesn't necessarily make it a non-aggression principle violation in of itself. So that's kind of how my understanding of contract has developed since speaking to you before. And I kind of want to develop it more and just and see if I am understanding your position correctly and, and what you can pick a holes in sort of my understanding of it. Right. As it develops. Well, and let me say, um, so my view is. I won't say it's that original. Uh, I didn't come up with it. This is basically my interpretation of Rothbard and, and, and Williams and Evers um, view of how contracts should work. And to me, it, as a lawyer and as a legal theorist, as libertarian, it makes sense. Uh, it is not the conventional view of contract law, and it's not what the legal how the legal system looks at it, and even how libertarians tend to look at it because they take sort of for granted the the framework of how we look at contracts. And like you said, they look at it as formalized promises or something like that, binding uh, obligations, legal obligations that result from formal promises, basically, something like that. Hmm. Um, so I think to sort all this out, we have to step back and, 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 and go back to fundamentals, back to the things that we agree on, which is 
I think that we would agree that like when we talk about the NAP or the non-aggression principle, aggression is a word that refers to basically physically violently hitting another person, usually their body. So, so the paradigm case of aggression is physical fighting between human beings, right? Um, and so if you're opposed to aggression, what that means is th that's the same thing as saying that people own their bodies. Because if you say that A should not hit B, that means that A should not use B's body without his permission, which is another way of saying B owns his body. So the non-aggression principle simpliciter or by itself simply recognizes ownership in people's bodies. Now, Libertarians extend that property rights scheme, which is an ownership of your body, or some people call it self-ownership. They extend that to other resources right in the world. Um, and so when you violate someone's property rights in another type of resource, we call that aggression. But I think it's more of an analogy or an extension of the core non-aggression. But the root of all this is the idea that every human actor has a certain proprietary right, which is why the word property comes from… From rights um, to control certain resources, including your body and other things that we we acquire rights in. Now, most of us believe that you acquire these rights according to certain principles, like homesteading and contract. Okay, so so contract really is just uh, an implication of the fact that when you own a thing. That means that you're the person who gets to, to consent to other people using it or to deny them consent. That's what it means to own something. right? So as the owner of a resource in a given legal system that we all agree with, um, the owner is the one who can consent or deny consent to others. Now, to deny consent or to express consent requires communication among human beings. You have to somehow indicate whether or not you do consent to someone touching or using your body or the resources that you have, right? Yeah. And over time, customs and conventions develop, and we use language and, and, and tradition and, and common sense about how people interact with each other to understand whether or not someone is the owner of an identifiable resource and whether or not they've granted consent or not for other people to use it. And then people can grant consent in different ways. They can do it temporarily. They can do it permanently. They can do it partially. They can do it in a, in a co-ownership kind of way. So there's all types of ways you can grant this consent, and this, to my mind, is what contracts are. So contracts are um, basically the exercise, the expression of consent by the owner of a resource. And typically, it, revol it involves alienable resources, the things that we acquire and that we can alienate, and typically it would involve a sale. Like that would be a complete divestment of ownership, but it doesn't always have to be, right? Like if you, if, if you, if you hire, a, hire or lease a car, rent a car from a rental company or an apartment or a flat, um, you have the right to use it for a certain period of time. And conditional upon you paying the rent and not using the resource um, in certain ways, things like that. So your, your, your right to use it or your so-called limited ownership right is limited by the contract between the owner and the, and the, and the temporary user of it um, or the partial user of it. So you can have all kinds of contracts. The, the, the simple case would be if someone owns a resource and they, they give it or they sell it to someone completely. But that's still a type of contract because it's the owner consenting to someone else taking over the resource completely and forever, right? So to my mind, a contract is simply – and this is how Rothbard and Evers look at it. A contract is simply the alienation or the transfer of title to an owned thing to someone else by your manifested or expressed communicated intent or consent. Um, now, th in the law, this is viewed – as a binding obligation that results from a promise. In Rothbard's view and in my view, a promise is illegal or extra legal. It's just it, it's sort of like the difference between marriage and the mar and, and the and the legal aspects of marriage. So in the law, like for example, in some civil law states, um, you have a marriage, which is just a private institute, a private arrangement or institution. 
like a religious thing or a civil thing or just a private commitment between a man and a woman or, or two people. Um, and then there are legal incidents that flow from that. Like so by two people deciding to be married and holding themselves out as married, they usually are communicating their consent that their resources be commingled and combined and co-owned in a certain way and that they have certain supervisory rights uh, to make medical decisions for each other in case one is incapacitated and to inherit from each other and to co-parent uh, um, and to co-own their home and things like that. So there are legal incidents that flow from a marriage, but it's not the same as a marriage. So in the law, like in Louisiana, where I'm from, you would have a marriage, which is a private thing, a private relationship. Um, and then you'd have a matrimonial regime, which is a legal incidents that flow from it. It would be like if you, um, you know, if you have a home in a neighborhood and you have your door open to everyone, it's sort of an implicit signal, according to the conventions and customs in the area, that you are consenting to people walking up to your door and knocking on it to ask you a question, but you know, not to barge into your house and use it for a slumber party or to kick you out. Um, so. All this has to do with communication and things like this. So to my mind, a promise per se is not really legal. It's a communication, and it's a, it's a private institution or a private uh, interaction between people. If you make promises and you don't uphold them, you break your promise, you will suffer reputationally and commercially because people will know that you're not reliable and things like that. But from a legal point of view, the only legal incident of that would be like the marriage, the matrimonial regime that flows from a marriage relationship. It's like what can we infer legally from the promise? To my mind – and this is where Rothbard and Evers made a mistake partly because they were pioneering this field, and they're not lawyers. Rothbard saw the problem with relying upon promise as the basis of contract. And we can go into that if you want to. There's there's some theoretical problems with the conventional legal theory uh, that that contracts are are enforceable promises, right? Um, so Rothbard saw the danger of that, but he went a little bit too far, and he basically said the word promise can never form a contract. I think that's wrong. I think that the word promise can serve as a as a substitute communication for your consent. Like if I say I promise to uh, deliver. Uh, these uh, these oil barrels of oil to you in a month um the promise per se is not enforceable it's not a binding obligation however saying that you promise it could be a way of transferring title to the barrels of oil in the future so you could do it in two ways you could say i hereby give you 100 barrels of oil in a one month in one month um but that's just a communication but as i said communication could be implicit or tacit express or implied, and using the word promise can indicate to, to, uh, to communicate your consent. Um, but it's not because it's a binding promise. It's just because the promise is understood by both parties to mean that you are transferring title to something. Um, so if you view contracts as binding obligations, like legally enforceable obligations, which is how the law does it now… What that means theoretically is that um, now because you've entered into a contract, you have made a solemn promise, and you, you paid consideration in the common law or whatever, um, you have a binding obligation. And if you don't fulfill that obligation, you are in breach of contract, which you could look at as a rights violation because the consequence for violating that right is there's some, there some legal penalty. And the legal penalty is that the court will say you have to pay damages like a financial payment. Now, the reason they do that is because the court doesn't want to use the force of the state and the courts to compel the person who didn't perform what he was obligated to perform. They don't want to compel him to do it because that is too hard to supervise and monitor. Like if someone promises to sing a song at someone's party and they fail to show up, then they breach the contract according to conventional theory, but the court can't make them sing the song the way they would have sung it originally because they may be under duress and they may be pissed off and they may do a bad job and then the the guy that's getting the song might not be happy with it and then the court's going to have to get back into it again and they don't have to do that over and over and over again so they simply say let's let's just make the guy that's in breach of the contract pay a financial payment 
which they call damages. Okay. Now, according to Rothbard, contracts are not binding enforceable binding obligations or promises. They are simply transfers of title, which means that if I promise to perform some action at someone's event in the future and I fail to do it, then I could have put into the contract a penalty payment, like a title transfer saying, you know, you're going to pay me money if I if I do sing or perform. But if I don't sing, then I will pay you some other damages payment. So the contract is really just a transfer of of titles that are conditional upon certain things happening or not happening, which is exact, which is actually with the way the positive law treats it without calling it that. Um, so, in my view, there is no such thing as a breach of contract because a contract is just an interconnected web of mutual and conditional title transfers. Like, if I sing, you pay me. If I don't sing, I pay you. And then, if I fail to pay you the damages. Then I got to pay you something else with interest and so on. Like there's a subsidiary or auxiliary claims. So it's just a web of, of title transfers, which means the contract just specifies the consent of the owners of things to transfer, which means there can never be a breach because you don't perform it. It just happens automatically by the consent you set in motion before. That's why to talk about violating or breaching a contract makes no sense. It's in, there is no such thing as a breach of contract. It's simply that if you fail to perform something that you promised, typically that means that you implicitly or explicitly agreed upon some damages payment uh, uh, to ensure that you would do it or to disincentivize you to disincentivize you from not performing. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I've got some questions though. Go ahead. I mean, I. I would like to, although I've got some questions first, but I would like to delve into the issue you have with Rothbard's assertion about contracts being a promise and stuff, because I think I, I, I haven't read as much of Rothbard as I should have, because I'm often told that things I say are things that he said. So perhaps I a lot of the things I'm a lot of the conceptualizations I have are very maybe similar to him in many ways. And often when I do read stuff from him, there, there he does say a lot of things that, that seem to be similar to what I'm saying or where. And I'm by the way, from. as an aside, Rothbard quite often in his reasoning said things that Ayn Rand herself said before or her followers, but he didn't sure. often give credit because he broke from her and and uh, uh, I'm not criticizing Rothbard for that, but it is true that a lot of his reasoning. Not not the contract theory stuff, but a lot of his reasoning. Anyway, so sometimes we we come across ideas from the from the from the from the ethos of what we're reading, or we read it and we forgot, or sometimes we independently come across it and it is something some earlier guy thought of. But yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So I would like to delve into that because I've got a feeling that I have a similar conceptualization of contracts to, to Rothbard. Um, and I'd certainly be interested to delve into where you see the problems with that. Um, but I also want to speak just about because um, how I separated my initial um, conceptualization where I was viewing contract violations as NAT violations because I was imagining all of these NAT violations that had some kind of breach of contract involved i want to delve into what you're talking about as well about there's no such thing as a breach of contract because i suppose from my point of view i'm thinking of contracts as formalized promises so i'm you can break a promise you can break a contract and it's almost the same thing you know um but the way the, the reason or, or sorry the way in which i moved away from my previous belief that contract violations were nat violations was largely due to your arguments whether i'm understanding them correctly or not but where i kind of i separated the contract from the nap violation when i was thinking of these examples for example i agree to sell you my car and take your money but don't give you my car the contract violate the contract the break of contract the broken promise that's not the nap violation the stealing your car or stealing your money whichever way you want to look at it um is is the NAP violation and the contract is really just evidence of that it's evidence Correct. that i transferred so I, I, ownership right I, yeah you meant, I, I was going to say um you mentioned that earlier i think the contract is evidence of who owns what so a, a, yeah. a NAP violation is always the use of someone's resource without their permission but to determine that we have to know who owns what and we have basically two rules i believe well we have three rules we have one rule for bodies which is basically the presumption is self-ownership which means every person who is a, an actor 
um, which means a, a person, a legal personality or, or, or an economic actor um, associated with and controlling a human body. So I think the primary libertarian rule is that the ownership of those human bodies is determined in accordance with the rule. The, the human actor or the human person associated with that body is the presumptive owner. Okay, That's the first rule. So self-ownership, you can call it. Yeah. Um, but for other things that, that are inanimate or even animate in the case of animals, but basically let's, let's talk about inanimate external resources or objects in the world and – Things that were that were previously unowned things that are not actors themselves, right? When humans use these employee and use these things as means, then um, then there can be conflict over them. That's why property rules emerge. And then so the libertarian and the and the private common law rule was always basically we determine the owner of these things by two rules. One is we ask who was the first person to use it, which is homesteading, Lockheed and homesteading, or original appropriation. You can call it that. Um, and second, contract, which means if if there was a previous owner who contractually assigned it to someone else. So what that means is all things being equal, the first person to start using it is the owner, unless he abandoned it, which is a consensual issue, or or, or a metaphysical issue like he dies and he doesn't exist anymore, so he can't own it. Um, or two, he consensually transferred it to someone else, in which case the guy he transferred it to, he's not the original homesteader, but he has a better claim than everyone in the world because, number one, he's got a better claim than the homesteader because the homesteader made a contract to give it to him. And he's got a better claim than everyone else in the world because he stands in the shoes of the homesteader by the legal principle of subrogation. So anyway um, – uh, the point is the contract identifies an owner of a thing. So in the case of Rothbard in his title transfer thing, he makes a couple of mistakes, and he does that because he's pioneering, and he he just missteps a couple of times. The, the first misstep is the word promise. He sees the danger of viewing the basis of contracts as binding promises because he understands that a promise is just a word that you say, and if you believe in free speech, typically… Force is not justifiable in response to someone for saying words, so he says it can't just be that. So he says it's instead a transfer of title, which he's right about. He's just wrong in thinking he, he like he's like a he's like a he's like a, someone afraid of vampires. They have a cross up in there. They don't want to hear the word. You know, he doesn't want to hear the word promise. But I think the word promise can be used. I mean, if you believe in implicit contracts where you can have a transfer of title without any verbal communication whatsoever, just by context, then why can't the word promise? Also serve that purpose in some cases, but the second mistakes he makes, and this gets to one of your points, is um, he says that if you don't, if if you have a loan contract where someone loans a sum of money to someone, and they're supposed to repay that amount plus interest at a at a future time, and the debtor doesn't repay, which is the same, which is a, a type of breach of contract in a sense, or a type of failure to perform. Rothbard says, technically speaking, they are a thief because they're stealing something from the from the creditor promise C, um, and therefore theoretically debtor's prison would be justified. But but then Rothbard realizes that would be sort of contrary to his inalienability stuff and his title transfer, and he says, well, but debtor's prison would be um, disproportionate punishment, so he backs off of it that way. But I think his mistake there is – so you can imagine two cases. Um, someone borrows 1,000 a, a pounds, and they owe 1,100 pounds in one year. Okay. Now, on the due date of the loan contract, the debtor has lots of money. So I would say that by the operation of the title transfer in the contract… 1,100 pounds of his money automatically converts to and transfers to the creditor. So at this moment in time, the creditor owns that money. Now, it's in the possession of the debtor temporarily, and that's not a, a tort because that's contemplated by the nature of the agreement. But, but the debtor has to allow the creditor to receive it. In other words, if he blocks him from doing that, at that point in time, he is committing a type of conversion or tort of trespass or theft or something like that because he's in possession of someone else's money and he won't turn it over. So in that sense, the contract would identify the owner of this 1,100 pounds 
It identifies that the owner is now the creditor, and if the debtor who's holding on to it doesn't release it, he's committing a tort, and that is a crime. That is a NAP violation, but it's not because of the contract. It's because he is in possession of someone's property, and he won't turn it over. If he's penniless, however, there is nothing to steal, and that was Rothbard's mistake. So if you can't pay the money back because you're bankrupt, then you're not committing a NAP violation because – um, see, the law would say you are because they view contracts as binding obliga obligations, and you're not fulfilling your obligation. But if you view it as a title transfer, then if you're if you don't have any money, there's no title to transfer. Like there's no object that you're stealing. So Rothbard and I think Walter Block trying to uh, trying to rehabilitate Rothbard's little error here. When I cornered him on this, he sort of thought about it and said, "Well, you're right. You can't steal something in the future that doesn't exist." So what you really stole was the original 1,000 pounds from a year ago. And said, so, well, but how can you steal it if the, lend, if the lender lent it unconditionally to you to use, which he had to do. It had to be an unconditional loan because the, the purpose of the loan is to give the borrower money he can spend on some project to try to make a profit, right? He might fail at his it profit. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but is it unconditional though? Because surely isn't the con terms of the contract part making it conditional? Like you know, it's no, conditional. I, no, it has to be unconditional. So, think think of a simple case. Um, the 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 lender loans one thousand pounds, and let's imagine these. This is back in the days where this is. Um, I don't know, a thousand pounds of, of actually uh, of silver, like some commodity that you can own. Keeps because value like, yeah. state money. State money complicates the issue because fiat sure. money doesn't even exist. But okay, let, let's assume it's a real commodity that you can own. Um, so you loan the money to someone. It's it's the contract is two reciprocal title transfers. In other words, the con the only condition on my giving you the one thousand pounds now. Is that you give me eleven hundred pounds in the future now? Like you make a prompt, you make a contract, you make a title transfer now. That's the condition. But once once I do that, then I've set in motion a future title transfer, which is the payment for my present title transfer. Okay, but we, we because we're aware of Austrian economics, we know that the future is uncertain. So any future, so the present title transfer is not uncertain because I have the I have the I have the money and I hand it over to you. It's done. But the future title transfer is uncertain. It's necessarily uncertain. So I am taking an exchange. In fact, the law calls this a sale of a hope. I mean, I, this is what risk taking is all about. The reason I'm giving you my a thousand pounds is in the hope that I get eleven hundred in the future. But I know there's some risk, which is one reason I charge interest. One reason I charge interest is because of the of of the of the time value uh, because uh, because of time preference. But another reason is because of risk. So as an entrepreneur, I'm taking some I'm taking the risk that I won't be repaid. I mean, this is part of this is part of life. Um, so the condition on the but but the, but the, otherwise the transfer of the of the original money has to be unconditional because otherwise the the borrower couldn't spend it. He, he need he's borrowing the money to start a, uh, to start a little business where he can make a profit. He needs to spend the money to buy supplies and things like that. How can he buy supplies from 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 vendors if he doesn't own the money? Because the vendor is going to say, "Do you have free and title property to this money? Otherwise, I'm not going to give you my supplies because the creditor might come chase me down and get the money back." Right. The whole purpose of this is so that the, the borrower can spend the money. So he has to have totally unconditional title to it. Um, and if he has unconditional, and by the way, if you ask the parties at the inception of the agreement, they would have to agree to this because they don't always agree to it because it's common sense. But if you if you force them to 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 put it down in writing, I'm sure they would agree to this because you know, if if, if I'm the attorney advising both sides, I would say to the creditor. Do you understand that the borrower needs to spend this money? Yes. But if, if the creditor says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a lien on the money where he doesn't have full title to it until a year from now when he repays me, well, then he can't spend it. So he's not going to be able to make a profit to repay me. I mean the whole deal would fall apart. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to 
get my wrap my head around it because I, I do understand what you're saying because I suppose the way I was conceptualizing it before was like I was using like the example of say I I, was, I agreed to sell you my car but if I agreed say um you, you transfer the money over to me like now but I haven't physically given you my car yet and let's say I'm going to give it to you tomorrow or next week or, or next year or whenever it doesn't you know really matter but so as far as I'm concerned, that car is now yours, even though it's not in your possession yet. It is your rightful property, even though I haven't given it to you. And if I don't give it to you, I've stolen what is now Correct. your your car. I, com I completely agree. Uh, the reason why I now I use that exact same thinking for the debt, you know, like for the money, you know, but I understand what you're saying, because unlike the car that actually exists, that I can actually transfer Correct. ownership over to you, if it's just the promise of some money that I'm hoping to acquire, then I understand, then I suppose there's a sort of invalidation to the contract in the same sense of the I'm not actually transferring ownership over to you because I don't have ownership well to transfer, I'm just making a promise to do. Whatever. Let me distinguish here. So, so, okay. uh, in a loan contract, the purpose of the loan is to loan someone money, and the reason they want money is to spend it. I mean, if you don't need to spend it, you don't need the money usually. So the purpose, the, the nature of this uh, this interaction is to be able to spend the money. So it has to be unconditionally transferred. Um, in the case of a car, so let's say you have a car and you want to sell it to me, and it's, let's say, 10,000 pounds, but I don't have that much money. So – you agree to basically finance me and you say, well, I will, I will pay you 1000 pounds a month until I pay you the full amount. Right. But in the meantime, I need to use the car. So you're going to give me the car, but what that means is you, you take a security interest in the car. It's collateral, which, which means from our point of view as, as libertarian uh, rock party and legal thinkers, what that means is, until the loan is paid off or the financing or the purchase price is paid off, you and I are in a sense co-owners of the car. Uh, you have the underlying right to the car. I have the right to use it, but the contract presumably would say something like, you know, if halfway through I quit paying, then you can repossess the car and you can sell it to pay what you're owed, or you can just get the car back and uh, I don't know, refund me part of it or something, but the contract would specify. So you have a complicated um, co-ownership situation until the deal is done. There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, I mean, it's it, it would be it's it's similar to a lease. I mean, look, my wife and I have leased a car from BMW, and it's a three-year lease. At the end of the lease, we don't own it anymore. We have to return it, but we can buy it for a certain agreed-upon price. So, but do you really own it during the lease as well? It depends on how you mean own. Um, if you mean own in the sort of allodial sense that everyone thinks of ownership as the absolute complete right, no. But ownership can be divided. I think of ownership as a as a juristic concept, which is not possession, but it's the legal right to possess. So, in in a redu in a reductionist sense, I think I do own a car that I'm leasing because I have the right to use it. So ownership means the right to use. So the question is whether it's complete ownership or not. So I think it's a co-ownership situation. So if well, I rent, if I hire a rent a car from Avis, then Avis owns the car and I co-own it in the sense of I have for a specified period of time, I have the right to use it. Now they can call me and say, you got to return the car. We've changed our mind. But Certain types of leases are not like that. They are actually considered real property interests in the law. Like if you lease a flat or an apartment um, for six, for one year, let's say, I think in some cases, in some legal systems, the the landlord cannot eject you until the term is up. You so you have a property right that is enforceable for that whole period. You 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 own you effectively own it. Now you don't completely own it because you can't. Uh, remodel it. You can't sell it to someone else, but you can stay there until the year is up. Uh, there's something in the law called life estate or um, a life usufruct. You know, there are different types of ways you can divide ownership. That concept has bothered libertarians, I think, because they have this allodial sense that that ownership has to be permanent and complete for it to be real. And I think that's because they have this aversion to the state. Um, uh, 
assuming the role of overlord like they do now, like in, in your country and in the U.S., if you own real estate, you don't completely own it because you own you owe property taxes. <laughs> if you don't pay property taxes, the government will take it from you, which yeah. means that the state has set itself up in the position of overlord in the common law type of, of system, uh, which means you're like you're like a lower owner down the totem pole. Uh, but for all practical purposes, you can sell it, you can mortgage it, you can have a lien on it, you can modify it, you can abuse it, you can destroy it. Uh, what can, about, sorry to interrupt, but what about no. the, because um, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the, the one thing, the only other pushback that I did have outside of what you mentioned that other libertarians would be concerned of with regards to the association of like, you know, how states, state is the applications of it. But the other bit of pushback I have was like when you were talking about the, the car being yours that you're leasing, I, I immediately thought back to this whole, um, the lending of the money and the unconditional nature of that lending of the money now i mean maybe this would depend on the specifics of the contract of the lease but the leasing of the car seems conditional in the way that the correct do you see what i'm saying so i think it is conditional i agree it's, so, it's, would it's, be a, limit, ownership, it's a limited ownership right whereas in a in a in a, in a debtor in a, in a loaning in a lending kind of what do you call it a loan contract um the loan of the money that transfer of, of the principal sum that is given from the creditor to the debtor is itself 100% unconditional. It has to be unconditional. The only condition is that I only make the transfer conditioned upon you making some other transfer back to me. Now, that transfer is a future transfer, which is where fraud comes in. So to my mind, fraud is the obtaining of possession or maybe title to something by deception. So to take a simple example, uh, a, the simplest contract imaginable – well, the simplest contract imaginable would be a gift or abandonment. Like if I, I own a, an apple and I give it to you, okay? So that's a one-way, unconditional, contemporaneous, contemporaneous title transfer. I give the apple. Now it's, it was mine. Now it's yours. The second most simple would be an exchange where… You know, we exchange an apple for an orange. So there are two title transfers happening at the same time. There's there's no condition in the future. Like anything that has a future component is conditional because the future is uncertain. But if it's two contemporaneous things, there's no condition except that each transfer is conditional upon the other transfer being made simultaneously. Which means that if I give you an apple conditioned upon you giving me an orange. Then the guy that has the orange who, who's a receipt of the apple, he is fully aware that his right to start using that apple that is handed over to him is conditioned upon him doing his part, which was giving an orange. And if he knows that he stole the orange and doesn't own it, or if it's a rotten or a fake orange, he knows that he's not fulfilling the, the requirements of that title transfer of the apple. So he knows that he didn't get full consent from the owner, like he didn't get informed consent, you could call it. So that's, to my mind, what fraud really is. Fraud is what you can call a subset of fraud and fraud law, theft by trick. Um, and the, so and the reason that the reason that counts as a type of aggression or a type of trespass against property rights is precisely because ownership, as we said earlier, ownership means, that you are the person who has the right to deny or withhold consent to others to use this thing, but consent is a communicated thing, right? So communication is always in a two or more way interaction between people, and it relies upon background provisions, custom, um, context, because you can never have express communication that is complete. It's always it always depends upon a background. Uh, interpretive uh, context, which is why you can have two people who don't speak their same language trade with each other. They could just point and hand, and they understand what happened. They understand enough for it to be um, a consummated transaction, right? Um, and so the fact that communication has to happen means that uh, um, both sides to this contract understand that there's a presumption of – you can call it a presumption of good faith, which most legal systems say that there is, 
which means they're both being honest about the material conditions of the contract because they both realize that each one is only parting with what they own for certain reasons, right? <clears throat> so to my mind, that's the basis of fraud. So libertarians oppose fraud, but only if you understand it as an outcome of property rights and contractual consent. Yeah, because I mean, I suppose I've always thought of fraud as simply like say theft but through deception, through a trick Correct. rather than through physical, physically taking like a mugging or something, but it's still theft. So that's why fraud is always a nap violation in my mind, because it is still a theft. Whereas, as you say, there could be a contract violation that doesn't involve any fraud, doesn't involve any um, anything like any actual theft. It could just be like, say, breaking a promise. And then it's not a nap violation because, I mean, I suppose the, the, the way I... So, the way, sorry, on, the, so the way I look at that is... When people enter into a contract, they're aware of the possibility of someone not living up to the promise that they made. So either they either they build in a title transfer to to account for that or they don't, right? Or either they assume that there will be an implicit one, right? And usually that's what they do. There will be customary or default or sublative rules that 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 accomplish that. So or they could it, make it conditional. Yes. Yes, you can. You can make like it. They could say this doesn't this isn't really yours unless you yeah. give me this in the future. And, kind and, of thing. and by the way, in a loan contract for a complicated large loan, you can have conditional aspects to it. For example, I loan you a million pounds. Uh, and it's supposed to be spent on this project. Now you're not usually going to spend the million on day one. You're going to spend it over the next several months on different things. Um, you could put conditions in there saying, you know, the creditor has the right to come in and inspect your records and make sure you're only spending it on what you're supposed to spend it on. Uh, and and if you spend it on something frivolous or outside the scope of this agreement, I would say that that spending is itself theft because you're using someone's property in a way that they don't consent to. And you know that. So that's a type of theft itself. Right. Um, or they but, could say. Well, yeah, sorry, sorry, but would that would that mean that that's part of a conditional loaning? So, like they've loaned it to you conditionally, so it's not really yours in that true ownership sense. Correct. You're just I, using I, it I, with I, their permission. I think it's it's the contract would say this: the creditor owns the money. Now, in those cases, to be honest, the creditor would just retain possession of the money. He wouldn't dole it all out. So, like on on day forty. The, the borrower would go to the – like it's a line of credit in that sense. So then the borrower goes to the creditor and says, okay, I need to make a payment to my vendor. I need you to make a payment to him. So then the creditor only pays who he thinks is part of the scope of the contract. If he gives all, it all to the debtor and let, lets the debtor put it into his bank account, he's taking the risk that the debtor might spend it without his permission, um, in which case he would be a thief. But then the question becomes – the third party who received the money, does he own it or does the creditor own it? Now, that's a separate, the thornier question. And in my view, um, if you have uh, – it, it's akin to the question of stolen property. So like if, 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 if B steals A's watch and sells it to C, and then B runs away with the money and is gone, now A finds C later like a pawn shop. Who owns the watch? Does the pawn shop own it or does the original owner of the watch own it? Now, I've I would always, say that before you tell me the answer, can ahead, I give yeah, you ahead. mine? Sure. Because, so, because uh, um, I mean, because you may or may not agree, but, but I've always my opinion of that has been that the original owner of the watch is the rightful owner and of the watch and the C has basically had his money stolen because he had money taken from him like defrauded out of him basically under false pretenses because he thought he was getting something rightfully in exchange and he wasn't. So for me, the watch belongs to the original owner and um, part the, the party who took that watch in good faith has basically been robbed by B who ran off with the money, who robbed both parties, basically he robbed one guy of his watch and then he robbed the other guy of his money Correct. by pretending that he owned the watch that he was but, quote unquote but, trading for it. But the point is either A or C is going to be out of something. So the question mm. is what should the who, who should the law who should the law make be the one who suffers from this deal? Now um I think your answer is probably usually the right answer and probably what the default answer would be. I also think it doesn't matter because I think whatever the legal system says um, people would tend to have title 
insurance that would cover this. So, so let's say the legal system uh, said the owner is out of luck and the pawn shop guy gets to keep it. Well, that's just going to mean that people are going to tend to have title insurance or they're going to tend to be aware of that risk. When you own or if you, if you own something, if some party B steals it, then you're screwed. And even if you find that thing in someone else's hands later, you can't get it back. Now, I think that's usually the wrong rule, especially in the case of real property. I think for real property, the original owner almost always gets it back. Yeah. I, I do think – and I think the law has an exception for like uh, – I think it's in the – it's been a long time since I took commercial paper in law school. But I think uh, uh, there, there's an exception in some cases where it's, it's really the fault of the original owner, like he's careless or negligent. So for example, when you have negotiable instruments like a check, someone writes a check. Now, I'm actually not sure if – negotiable instrument and commercial paper law is actually compatible with libertarian contract theory. <laughs> That's another thing no one's written on. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a concept of negotiability, which is a special legal thing in the positive law, which I'm not sure uh, makes sense. But what that means is if I have money in a bank and I write a check to someone to draw money on that bank, I'm, I'm directing my bank to give money to someone, right? Um, the rule is if I don't sign that check, it's not valid. So if someone steals one of my checks or makes a forged check and they, they get money from my bank that way, I can say I never authorized it, so I still have the money, and the bank is the one that's on the hook, which – okay, let's say we agree with that rule. However, there's an exception if I was careless and like I, I left my checkbook on my dresser in my bedroom when I had workers over at my house preparing you know the ceiling or something like that so like i should have known this this could happen i didn't take precautions and in that case i'm more responsible for the bank giving the money to of uh, the wrong party than the bank is in that case i shouldn't be able to complain so you can see exceptions being made so if 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 i just like left my watch on a park bench or something like that and some guy steals it and then a pawn shop buys it i mean who should suffer the loss, the pawn shop or me? But again, in both cases, I think people would tend to have – for expensive things, they would tend to have title insurance that would cover um, a loss if the legal system doesn't go your way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly understand the exceptions when you know you, you are more at fault for the – the, the 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 violation the crime and, and the in the, that case the burden probably of proof would be on the third party who would otherwise be left um uh, he would he would be divested of the of the property he bought and he would be out the money he paid for it in that case maybe it would be an affirmative um cause of action for him to make he would have to satisfy a burden of proof that look normally yeah. i'm normally i'm in possession of stolen property but because of the negligent actions of the original owner he should suffer the loss not me so you'd have to make that argument yeah it's, it's almost like saying the default is that it would be the original owner i think so but I the, think so. you can imagine scenarios where Correct. there may be exceptions if that original owner was criminally negligent or negligent in some way that they're to blame for the for the loss or, or whatever so yeah I, I can totally take that point. yeah or if you, I, you know you you let you let some uh you go down to the homeless shelter you let some some junkie come live at your house for a while who's got a criminal history and i mean and they they steal they steal your watch <laughs> i mean uh, it's not the pawn shop's fault that you weren't careful with your belongings you know something like that yeah yeah i understand what you're saying i mean yeah yeah i mean it's cuz i suppose the way i'm trying to like i say i'm, I'm trying to polish my own understanding of this and it's like it's it's helping me understand you know what a contract is which i still kind of view as a formalized promise but i don't see the same problem that rothbard saw with regards to the burden of that formalized promise because i don't think that you i don't think the promise alone obligates you um like like for example with the title transfer like if i you know like like we said before like if i um say oh, i'm selling you my car for such and such money but i don't give you my car then i've basically stolen your car because it's now your car because i have transferred that property over to you whereas 
in a different scenario where I'm just making a promise to do something and then I break that promise, there's no actual transfer of property that you can point to of, of theft. I've just broken the promise. But as a self-owning individual, I have the right to do that. And you have taken that leap of faith. You, yeah, you've got the contractual proof that I broke my promise, but so what? All well, let, let, me, let me explain that. So in the law, the law has struggled for centuries with why exactly do we enforce promises or, or why are contracts enforceable so there's there's different uh justifications that have been trotted out for this and one of them is called uh detrimental reliance so the idea is that someone makes a promise to do something and someone else says okay i really need to be able to rely upon your promise because uh, you know if you promise to supply me with with inputs to my chemical plant or my, my my refinery my chemical ref my, my petrochemical refinery if you don't provide it, then I'm going to be out millions of dollars. So I need to be able to rely upon that. And the guy says, I really promise you, I'm going to do it. I give you my word, whatever. And then, so the chemical, the pet, the refinery makes, it changes its position in reliance upon you doing it. Like it starts making orders and making contracts of its own to, to promise um, uh, the, the output product and this kind of thing. Um, so that's said to be in the law. It, someone someone relied upon your promise to their detriment meaning if you don't perform they're going to suffer the problem with that reasoning as randy barnett who's one of the pioneers of the libertarian um theory of contract he's not quite the same as rothbard's title transfer theory he's got a different type of theory which is which is better than the conventional law but i still think it, the rothbard's makes more sense to me but but randy barnett points out um he calls it a consent theory of contract. Uh, Randy Barnett points out that the and other other scholars have pointed this out too. The problem with basing enforceable contracts based upon con binding promises or promises because of detrimental reliance is that it's totally circular because the law always says that when you rely upon someone's promise, it has to be reasonable reliance. Okay, because you can't just have someone just say I relied. It has to be reasonable, right? What reasonable people would do. But reasonableness of reliance depends upon whether the legal system would enforce the promise. Because if you know that the legal system doesn't enforce promises, then it would be unreasonable for you to rely upon it. Or or put it this way, if you rely upon it, it's at your own risk, right? Just like, you know, if a girl says she's going to be your wife forever <laughs> and you marry her and then 20 years later she wants a divorce, I mean you relied upon her promise, but there's no contract breach in the legal sense. Theoretically, you know, technically, you don't own her body; you can't force her to stay your wife. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. The point is, people sometimes rely upon promises, and they take the risk that the person making the promise is going to change their mind or not fulfill it, or be unable to fulfill it, or whatever. So, the problem with detrimental reliance is that it's circular, and this is pretty well known. So. It's like incoherent. It's like it's an it's an after it's it's an ad hoc um, it's a make weight argument. I think the real reason contracts are enforceable is because people think it's just essential to it's essential to commerce. Like it's a consequential thing. If you don't have this institution, then modern commerce won't 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 work. But what they fail to re realize is number one, the power of reputation is great. So people, even if you don't have a financial penalty for breaking a contract, so called breaking a promise in a contract <clears throat> lots of companies will will be very reluctant to break it because they know that they'll suffer and number two you can as i said the the awards given even in today's legal system when you break a contract is just a payment of money but you could put that into a contract as a title transfer so you can you can still do the same thing um with the title transfer it's just you don't you don't have the idea of breach of of a binding of binding promises as, as as the core of it well yeah because i suppose i mean that's why i didn't feel like the issue of of contract enforcement was a problem because like if someone was to say to me and i'm talking about how contracts should work not necessarily how they do today but how they should if they were you know done properly and inconsistent with the principle but like if someone said to me okay what well, are contracts enforceable i would kind of ask them well what do they mean by that because for example if i have a contract to sell you my car and you give me money and i agree that i've sold you my car but i don't give you my car i've stolen the car because 
in that situation, and, and I could say, well, that contract's enforceable because you can, we're going to enforce that I'm the owner of the rightful owner of the car because yeah. you this contract proves that you gave the ownership over to me. The reason why that's enforceable is because you've you've I'm not we're not enforcing you to keep a promise. Correct. You've already you've already done it. The Correct. fact that you haven't fulfilled the promise of handing over possession is means you've robbed some you know you're robbing somebody of something that they now own but you've already transferred the ownership so it's not like it's i suppose it's the difference in my mind between saying give me a thousand pounds and i'll give you my car but i'll actually physically give it to you next week and then i don't i run off of it or whatever the difference between that or me saying the alternative is me saying give me a thousand pounds and next week i promise I will give you my car. And in that situation, if I don't give you my car, I've n like, it's like, I'm not, I've not tried, like, I'm like, you're not buying the car off me for a thousand pounds. I know it sounds a bit convoluted, but I'm saying, I'm saying, please give me a thousand pounds. And I promise that I will give you my car in a week. But I've not, I've not given it to you yet, if you know what I mean. Correct. Whereas, so, 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 I mean, I know that it doesn't normally work that way, but I'm saying like technically, like I'm just trying to break apart what the contract is. Well, in, in, that, ca in that case, I would say it just is a, is a question of interpretation of what the communication meant. So if you literally meant, I'm going to give my best efforts to give you a car, but that's all I'm going to promise. And the guy giving you money is willing to, you know, he's paying for that, that hope. That's fine. Yeah, but usually just to clarify, you, I sorry, just to clarify, I am working on the assumption that it's clear what these the, the you know these these stipulations are clear. Both parties understand them. So I am working that I, under I that. I think that yeah. in most cases that type of arrangement would that would be interpreted to mean I am hereby transferring title in 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 the future in one week to you to this car. So right, yeah, the but transfer if you the transfer that is that wasn't the case. The if transfer you stipulated, is future. But if you right. stipulated, like, yeah, I, I I see what you're saying there. Because but then you're still making the transfer today. You're just saying that it, it, it it's, it's a future like, transfer. That it's a future transfer. But you've 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 transferred the ownership today, but for for the next future day or for a future which day. which means that it's conditional. So it it would be it'd be analogous to me saying. Um, I've got this big warehouse behind me and the doors are closed. And in that warehouse, I might or might not have a car. Okay. And I'm going to transfer it to you the contents of the warehouse for a thousand dollars. Okay. So the guy giving the thousand dollars, he's buying something uncertain. And that's perfectly legitimate if you want to do that. Um, yeah. It's gambling in a sense, right? It's yeah. Like I mean, it's, a not, game it's show. not a contract I want to enter. So if he gives me a thousand dollars. I open the door and there's no car there. Well, that's what he gets, right? Um, similarly, if I say I'm giving you a car in a week, let's say I don't have a car, but I have an inventory, car is coming and going, and I, I'm saying there's a very high likelihood, and I will do everything in my power to get a, cor a red Corvette for you that I'll give to you in, in one week. And if I own that car in one week, it becomes yours. But the if has to be there because it's in the future. I can't give you a car in the future that doesn't exist. I can only give you a car in the future that does exist. Um, right, yeah. Whereas with the car that I have, I can transfer ownership. Even though I'm not physically giving it to you yet, I can give you ownership right away. And the contract would serve as evidence that that's yeah. what I've done. So, And if, if you keep in mind the distinction between... Um, Ownership and possession. So, uh, ownership and possession are different things. So, for example, you're 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 you're, you're on vacation and you you're with your your wife and you hand your phone to someone to take a picture of you, some stranger. You can't accuse the stranger of trespassing by by manipulating your phone for those forty five seconds. However, if they run off with it, they're stealing it. So. Ownership is temporarily slightly divided, and possession is definitely separated from you. And you took the risk, but but you didn't lose the ownership because you didn't consent to them stealing your phone, right? Um, and earlier you said about contracts being enforceable. I think the best way to think about it is to say to ask whether not contracts are never enforceable. Property rights are enforceable. Con the question is: Is the contract effective? In other words, did it 
did it serve to transfer title to something? So it's evidence of title transfer. That's what it is. Contract is simply a formalized, uh, non-simple evidence of title transfer. And I say non-simple because when you're the owner of a resource, it's always a question of whether you consent or not to someone using it. Like if you allow – if a girl allows a guy to, to give her a kiss, she's consenting to him temporarily using her body in that limited way. But we don't usually call that a contract. But it, in a sense, it, it's a reducible form of contract because mm -hmm. it's just the expression of consent by the owner of a resource. Typically, we reserve the concept of contract to um, to more or less complete alienations of ownership to alienable resources uh, based upon certain conditions being fulfilled. So they're usually future-based, which means they're uncertain and conditional, and the transfer – is from A to B completely, but not always. You can have a lease, you can have a co-ownership, you can have, you know, like a timeshare condominium or something. You have sure, yeah. three people own something. And if three people own a home, then as to the rest of the world, A, B, and C, or or like a unit that owns it. Like that's what a corporation is in a sense. Mm. But as between themselves, they have a contract specifying, okay, A can use the the condo on even even days of the week and, or whatever. You know, they have a contract between themselves which specifies how they own it. And if they can't come to an agreement, then they have to just sell it and split the proceeds. I mean, there's no other no other way around it. Just like when a divorced couple or or, or put it this way, when, when when a father dies and leaves his home to his two children, if they can't agree how to use it, then they have to sell it and split the proceeds. There's just no other there's no other way. But from the point of view of the rest of the world, they own it. But from the point of view of each other, they have a contract between them that specifies their respective usage rights. Well, I suppose because they both own it and they both have that right, like the 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 own the right that they have beyond other people being the owners obviously gives them an advantage over others, but it doesn't give them an advantage over each other. They have that equal claim to it. So they need to negotiate. If they can't negotiate how to use that product, then yeah, like you say, the only practical- And it might not be, be equal. Just... It, it might not be equal. Rights are not always symmetrical. I mean, you could have like a, a landlord versus a tenant, or you could have um, uh, in a corporation, someone has someone owns 80%, someone owns 20%. So you could have- uh, uh, or at a timeshare, someone can use it in the holidays and someone can use it in the off season. So, you know, you can have you can have a, a non uniform and non symmetrical division of ownership, which is something I think even Hoppe, like so, some Austrians think that ownership has to be unitary. I think ownership has to be unitary in the sense of a res or an in rem right. Like when you look at the thing. If it's an in rem or a property right, that means it's good against the world, even though people didn't consent to it by contract. It's not a contractual or an in personam right. It's a, but that means that they can identify who controls it and who who they have to go to to get permission. That can be one person, but it could be a group of people. Like in the case of a, mar a husband and wife, they co-own their their home. Uh, you, you can't use that home unless one of the owners gives you permission. Right, and if if they if they don't agree with each other, then they have to they have to divorce because <laughs> they're basically deadlocking each other and Correct. crippling each other's ability to use their property because they can't assert a dominant right over the other and or yeah, or, yeah. or they're both granting permission to everyone to use it and you have conflicting uses of I mean yeah yeah I mean I, to be honest one thing you just said that really helped it kind of click into my head and I, I think this is helping me understand this a lot better is when you said contracts aren't enforceable property rights are enforceable because then I immediately said well okay yeah I suppose because the contract is nothing but evidence of the property rights like evidence of a of a property transfer for example like evidence that you now own my car for example so it's not a case of i mean again this is why if someone said to me is property is our contracts enforceable i wouldn't give them a flat out no because i'd want to elaborate and explain what i meant with that no but i would sort of say no but property rights are and contracts can often serve as evidence of the property rights a little bit like 
and this is how I've kind of um, changed my conceptualization of the whole are contract violations NAP violations? No, but they may be evidence of a NAP violation, like a theft or a fraud or fraud or something like that. And it's the same with uh, are contracts enforceable? No, but property rights are enforceable and the contracts may be evidence of the property rights that you were enforcing. And, and promises can be evidence of a contract. Yes because, yes, because because it's a communication, not because promises are themselves enforceable, but because a promise is sometimes a way of saying that you're transferring property. Like if if you say I'm giving you a thousand dollars to to as a pre order for this uh, iPhone, and Apple says, okay, I promise to give you the iPhone in two, in a month. I mean, that's just another way of saying. I'm transferring. It's yours now. I'm just going to give you. Yeah, I mean, I suppose from the way I'm seeing it, it is, and it's like you say, and this is very much implied. Like most people will just understand this implicitly. But you know, like 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 you buy my car, you transfer the money, so I've already got possession of the money. Yeah. But the ownership of the money was with me even before the 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 the, yeah. the possession of it because and because you, you've confirmed that in the contract, the ownership of the car is with you now. But the possession of the car might not be with you now because I haven't actually driven it around to you and dropped it off yet and maybe i don't and i've stolen your car but so i i I, yeah i I this is helping me a lot it's it's, i mean you you could imagine a cheeky uh a smart ass person who says uh okay someone says you know i want you to deliver um this honey to me in a month okay after you get done harvesting the honey and i say well you need to pay me ahead of time you need to give me a deposit and they say, am I buying the honey? And I say, well, I'm not going to give you the honey, but I'm going to, pr- I'll promise to do the best I can. And if they refuse to say, I'm giving you the honey, but I'm just going to make a promise that's not technically enforceable, then, you know, you're taking the risk, <laughs> which most people wouldn't do. So this would be a rare case. So I think Rothbard's concern about promises is he's, wants to have a blanket prohibition on the word promise serving as a substitute for a contractual title transfer because he's focused on the rare weird case. But I think there's just nothing – there's nothing in black letter law that says that, that says ahead of time what can serve as evidence of communication of consent. It could be, it could be customary. It can be by context. It can be implicit. It can be by uh, habit of the parties, like a longstanding way of doing things. Uh, it can be by written. It can be by oral. Uh, sorry, uh, by oral communication. Um, and the word promise can sometimes. I think the word promise. You know, if you if you have a jury trial and you, the question is to the jury is, did the owner consent to transfer a title because he said I promise to give you the car in a week. I think in some cases they would say, yeah, that's what he meant. And that's what the that's what the the other guy thought he meant. And and the seller knew that he thought he meant that. So we're not doing an injustice to him by taking property by recognizing property title in the buyer in this case. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that are implicit and un, and unspoken because they just implicitly understood. Um you know, we like you say, we have uh, even people from different cultures and backgrounds. There's a certain commonality with regards to our interpretation of reality, and certain things are implied with things that we, you know, we don't have to be explicit on every aspect. That, like, you know, not only that, you can't be. This is the, this well, the yeah. point to recognize. You you can never have this. Why con- even you have a 75 page contract? There's always some eventuality that would not be contemplated because language is not complete and because the future is uncertain. So you can never have every condition um, taken into account. So you have to assume that both parties agree on some dispute resolution process in the event that the contract doesn't cover something that comes up that's unanticipated. So they put in things like force majeure clauses, which is an act of God clause, or they'll just say, listen, we appoint a neutral third-party arbitrator to settle the dispute, and we agree to abide by his decision uh, even if we don't agree. Because sometimes you just have to have finality, and there's no right answer. But we do the best that we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I understand that much more. Uh, And and like I say, that has helped me because although I did understand where you were coming from with the whole contract violations aren't that, and there's no such thing as a breach of contract. I mean, that part confused me. But the I did get my head around the 
the you know contract violations aren't nat violations thing because I did real all of, while I was thinking of all these examples of nat violations that involve breaking contracts, I could also think of breaking contracts where there was no nat violation. You know, so it, for me, I suppose, and and that's what kind of hit it home for me that it's not the contract that's the net violation it's if there's a theft or fraud involved then that's the net violation and the yeah, contract I, is just and by the way it. i think as a practical matter probably 90 plus percent of cases of so-called contract breach there is no net violation it's just one party didn't perform and the contract contemplates a remedy in that case which would be like a title transfer um this is so, why we have things like deposits as well, isn't it? Correct. To, to kind of insure against these eventualities of the contract and, and, not being And fulfilled. escrow is sometimes used in certain cases. So a third party holds on to it and only transfers it when everyone's satisfied that the conditions were met. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and that's why um, there's better business bureau. People can file complaints. The anti-fascist and, and as you say, also, there is obviously um, the reputational implications of breaking contracts and other things that are, I mean, this is one point where that, and I don't want to divert the conversation, but this is one of the points I made to Mark when we were speaking about like enforcement of gray areas and things is there's more than well, the, probably enforcement is probably the wrong word, but there's, there's more that can be done to encourage things that we can't use violence to enforce, you know, like, for example, where we can't forcefully make someone honor a contract and you say oh well where's the incentive for them to honor the contract well there's still incentive for them to honor the contract because their reputation is destroyed if they don't honor their contracts so and no one else will make a contract with them so even if you have these break so the concern that people have about oh well contracts won't work then is like well they will work because when you've got title transfers that takes care of itself because the ownership's transferred in you know that like you say it's not about enforcing the contract it's just about enforcing property rights and the contract serving as evidence of the property right um but also you've got even when you're stepping outside the realms of where you can actually use force to enforce something you have still got these other aspects like the reputational destruction like the fact that other people won't deal with you when you're a known liar and somebody who never you know fulfills their promises so i think those i think those things combined kind of push back against the claim that oh well if we can't you know just you know inf and and this Segues well, a well, little, the, well, the, sorry, the fact on. that contracts are not specifically enforced now, like in courts, they do not force you to perform. Yeah. All they do is they award a payment of damages if you don't perform, which you could do in a title transfer system. So the, the way the system works now could work almost exactly in a title transfer system. And, and by the way, there, there's a there's a <clears throat> you know the Chicago School of Economics, the kind of law and economics types. Um, they have a theory called efficient breach. So they sort of sense the problem with calling a breach of contract a breach because they sense that, you know, in some cases it makes sense economically to breach a contract. Like if A and B are supposed to have a merger and B, B gets a better offer from C and he can break the contract and do the merger with C and have enough surplus money from that deal to pay the damages to A, then that's in the Chicago school, that's called the efficient breach. So they, but what that really means is you shouldn't have breach at all, right? As a concept. And what uh, the damage, sorry to interrupt, but would just to clarify, would the damages that are like in, in written into this contract, would that essentially be um like title transfers yeah. that have been put into the there would be title transfer it'd be so like payments. if i do this you now own that kind of thing. But 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 the, but then the problem is in the positive law and the conventional law. If you view contracts as being binding obligations and you and you have the concept of breach, <clears throat> sometimes because the amount of damages that you have to pay for a breach is uncertain, like it's up to the jury, sometimes parties will put what's called a liquidated damages clause in the contract. They will have a clause saying, in the event of breach, here's how much you have to pay, Okay, because it, it leads to certainty. However, if it's too much, the law will not enforce it because they call it a punitive clause, and they say that because the law, there's a criminal part of the law, and there's a civil or private law part, the the, the purpose, uh, the role of punishment is taken by the criminal law. So you can't have a punitive liquidated damages clause in a in a civil contract. So 
if you put a liquidated damages clause in a contract that is too high, that would be beyond the amount that per, that permits uh, efficient breach to happen, for example, then the court won't enforce that. Now, as a, as a libertarian, I think that's wrong. I think that whatever title transfer you put in the contract should be enforceable, even if it's extremely high. So like if you want this guy to go through the merger, you're going to pay them a billion dollars. But you want to make sure they go through with it. They don't. They don't change their mind and go with a better offer from someone else. You put a liquidated damages clause of say ten billion in there, and if they agree to it, then I think they've agreed to it. They basically tied their hands and they've made it impossible for them to breach the contract. But that was what they agreed to. That's perfectly fine. The current law wouldn't permit that because it's punitive. Do they owe you the ten billion then? I think they would. Yes. Right. Which means they wouldn't do it. How does that no. separate from? Go ahead. But so, well, the only thing that I'm, I'm kind of with you on most of this, but the, the one thing that that does raise with me is I mean, is it dependent on whether they have that 10 billion? Yeah, of course. There and then, like, like, like if, yeah. yeah, okay. But, so the, but still, the point so is, it still comes back to that earlier point. Yeah, of, but the point is, this party B is only going to do the deal with C if C can pay them enough so that they can pay off the damages to the other because like let's say they pay them seven kind of like billion collateral for the for, for the for, no, it's not collateral it's just it's just um so a and b have a deal a is going to acquire b b gets paid a certain amount of money b agrees to pay damages to a if they don't go through with the deal if, if you know if the due diligence and all that's met um and if it's like say seven billion dollars then it's just impractical that C is going to pay them 10 so that they could still come out ahead with the 3 billion extra. They might pay them five, but that's but all the five would go to A. So so then B would not defect, um, which would be the, the whole purpose. But if you imagine like like um like a lot of employees, um, these traders at Morgan Stanley and these big oil companies that they get huge bonuses every year, right? They get paid, I don't know. You know, a million dollars bonus, and they also have a retention bonus where, like, they have a, a part of the bonus is deferred for three years. So, this employee, if they leave the employee of this company, they're 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 leaving say three million dollars of future payments on the table, which means that another employee that wants to poach them, employer that wants to to poach them, has to pay them a sign on bonus equal to all those deferred bonuses that they would miss out on so that's like a poison pill in a sense like so they set up a situation where um where it's very difficult for for some other employer to poach their employees but it's still theoretically possible someone wants to pay you 10 million dollars i'll take the 10 million i'll leave the 3 million on the table with my current employer and i'll 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 go and i'm happy it's just very unlikely that if you're only worth one or three million to one employer you're going to be worth 10 to someone else so Anyway, the point is if you if you look at it as title transfers, then you don't even need to resort to this efficient breach theory. You just let people negotiate whatever they want, but you have to have the enforceability of what's now classified as punitive liquidated damages clauses because there's no such thing as punitive. And in fact, in the libertarian world, I'm not sure if there would be a distinct civil and criminal law spheres. I think everything would be a one unitary system. Yeah, I agree with that. Actually, I mean, that's actually a point I've made in debates with other people about. In fact, I think you might have caught some of those um, conversations with regards to. And I don't know if you fully agree with me on this, but like I've always had an objection between the distinction between civil and criminal law as it yeah. is today, because for me, some things that are civil laws where there's an actual crime, an actual net violation, which for me are the same thing. Um, is a crime it's criminal for me because it's a net violation and this whole civil thing seems to me like a perversion because they like to put in a lot of things that aren't really crimes and they call them oh well it's only a civil offense no and i just feel like that's a kind of it seems like a sleight of hand to try to pervert law in general you know for me either you're violating someone or you're not if you are i I agree you're committing a crime and if you're you're not then you're not yeah i think you're leaning in my direction which is in the past, some legal theorists, some libertarians have said that you should collapse criminal law into civil so that there's only civil law. Um, I appreciate what they're, they're trying to see a unitary basis of the law. Um, and in one sense, I agree with them because I do believe that even – so I think they're kind of wrong in the sense that I think 
civil law collapses into criminal because in the end, yeah. the only violation of rights is force is is aggression and force. And the only way to enforce a right is the use of force. And so basically the bottom of everything is criminal. Yeah. So property the, the legal system is property rights in in that it identifies who owns what, but then the law is basically re, remedi remediatory, whatever the word is. It, it basically says what you can do in response to a violation of your rights to an act of aggression. So it's always criminal. However, in practice, I think that even though criminality is the basis of everything or aggression and criminal law, the way that the institutional system would enforce rights would be civil in the sense of it would be restitution based because. But isn't that more due to, sorry to interrupt, but isn't that more due to it just being a proportionate response rather well, not than it having not, to be a civil distinction? Uh, n no, I, I, think, I think it's not just because it's proportionate. I think it's because. Uh, pu uh, punishment retribution is more way more expensive than restitution because if you punish someone first of all you have to pay to do that and you don't get anything out of it unless you have a slave labor camp or something and that's not going to be efficient um so it's going to be a big cost and who's going to pay that the victims who've already been victimized and second of all if there's a mistake made now you're the aggressor, and so there's all kinds of uh, liability, which means I think it's very hard to envision an institutionalized system of punishment. So imagine private prisons and private punishment agencies. Who's going to bankroll them? Who's going to pay their fees? Where are they going to get insurance from? How, uh, what good would it do? So I think in general, the institutional response would tend to be restitution-based, but it's still based upon ultimately the right to punish for a violation of your rights. Uh, it's just that it would tend to be worked out in a restitutionary way because that's more peaceful, that's more uh, rehabilitatory, it's it's just cheaper, um, <clears throat> and things like that. Um, so, but with regards to what you have the right to, because I understand what you're saying, it, like you know, it would make more sense to approach you know these violations in this way rather than that for you know for your own benefit. But with regards to what you have the right to do, for example, if you wanted to exert that extra money Correct. and time and pressure to say punish the person Correct. as long as it was within what you have that Correct. proportional right to do based on their aggression and you know, if you were violation. if you didn't if you if you're certain you were correct and all that yeah so so that yeah. i think that you would have occasional say you want to call it outlaw or vigilante justice um i just don't think it would be institutional because you i can't imagine agencies that emerge to do this because it would just be fraught with liability and it just wouldn't be a viable I mean, you might have the occasional rich guy who would do it. I think they would just hire a mercenary or they would go – they would just go take the guy out after the trial. They would – instead of taking the monetary payment or the ostracism, they would just plug the guy. And I think the community would just avert their eyes, and they would let it go probably unless the guy did it in a very dangerous way. Like he, he did it multiple times or he – or he did it in a way like let's say uh, let's say uh, some guy you know rapes your daughter and he gets tried he 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 confesses and he agrees to pay punishment but you don't you don't want to take that and you can't find an agency that's going to capture the guy and punish him because they don't want to take the liability um, uh, and so you just go and you, you shoot the guy in the head but you do it in front of a crowd and you could have shot a bystander or maybe you do you know and, and so everyone looks at you as a as a because you didn't show a willingness to respect the the normal way things are done you didn't show a willingness to accept arbitration and all this kind of stuff you show yourself to be kind of a dangerous outlaw you might have your insurance rates go up maybe no insurer will insure you now maybe you'll be ostracized uh, maybe you'd be looked at as a dangerous outlaw yourself so i think that there would be disincentives to people going too far outside the lines i could imagine i could imagine an occasional act of vigilante justice and if you know some guy gets just killed by a few neighbors because he's just hated by everyone. He's a danger to society. I think no one's going to raise a ruckus, and it would it would be passed over. But it would be an I think it would be tend to be ad hoc and isolated. But that's just my guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that I think vigilante justice would be relatively rare. I'm right. not sure I agree that institutional, depending on how we're defining that. Um, in for criminal like a like a private corporation that has a jail and a punishment yeah and, tor I'm not so and sure torturers that... and all that kind of stuff i don't well, know I'm not, 
I'm not so sure that liability would prohibit that kind of setup. Well, it's not just I liability. Think- it's also, is it viable as a business model? Like how many people are going to be, how many victims of crimes are going to have the money and be willing to spend the money to incarcerate and torture people and to pay the extra bond in case you're wrong? And I mean, I just don't, mm. it'd be such a, a limited amount of people that would do it. Partly because I think that a restitution system would satisfy most people. So you'd have a very low clientele, I believe. I just don't think it would be a viable business model. But I, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I mean, that's the sort of thing that I think we would only be able to know the answer to if we, you know, ran the experiment. We try so it, to speak. Yeah. I yeah. mean, maybe you have Australia, you have Coventry, you have some island where you, where you uh, out, you you just eject everyone and you go let them live there. And, and you know, you... well, I suppose the reason why I see it as potentially working in that kind of setup, like having kind of, I mean, I like like for example, with what I proposed with the whole nation's insanity project of establishing the non-aggression principles law, and people say, well, who would enforce that law? And I'm like saying, well, everyone would have the right to, although obviously, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. everyone doesn't have the equal ability to. But I said, but this, I I don't see any problem with having. Um, even public serving non nap enforcement, if you like, like yeah, an equivalent yeah. uh, to police. Or I whatever. agree. I agree with you on that. Yeah. And, um, and the liability that you talk about, rather than like prohibiting such things being done on an institutional level, I think it would just keep them honest. Because, could. for example, one of one of the things, one of the big selling points I make with like you know the idea i present is i say like you know look a lot of the corruption and stuff that we see the problems with police brutality and all of that sort of stuff one of one of the many things that causes that is the fact that police have these extra powers these extra rights these extra protections and in a truly free society where the right to enforce the non-aggression principle is governed by the principle of self-ownership and and you know and everyone has that equal right then these organizations these you know, police or NAP enforcers, for want of a better word, would 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 not be able to operate with this impunity, with this immunity. They would have to have that, and that would keep them more on it. They wouldn't that that obligation to not arrest innocent people, that obligation to not use excessive force, would be um, would be what would prevent the police brutality. Because all of a sudden, like right now, if a policeman you know beats somebody up. It, some of them go to prison, but most often they don't even get punished at all. And the ones that Correct. do will get some just maybe lose their job. Or something. They don't face criminal charges often. There's, they, you know, there's all these things that protect police and give them extra rights and powers to violate us in ways that normal citizens couldn't. If all of that was stripped away from them, true law enforcement, what I'm calling proper law, you know, protecting people's rights, can still be done. Um, and I think it would be done far more effectively because, you know, like people seem to think that, you know, we need to give police these powers so that they can, the, the, the irony in me that people think that we need to give police the power to violate our rights so they can protect our rights. And I'm like, no, no, we, we need a system where no one's allowed to violate yeah. rights. And under that system, yeah. the people that are charged with protecting rights will do a fo- will, will be accountable because Correct. if they violate rights, they're just as criminally um, it, 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 responsible yeah, as it, anyone else. It could be that the costs of such an institutional system are far lower than I'm imagining because most of the costs now are because it's run by the state. So yeah. you could be right. The cost could be so low that it could make it economically viable. Um, I could imagine instead something like this. Um, there's a private system of restitution where when there's an offense, there's a a, a, a tribunal or a trial or a hearing, and you can't. Let's say you can't even force the defendant to appear, in which case you have it at, in absentia and you render a judgment. But let's say the judgment is rendered and the guy is guilty of some severe crime, and they say, "Listen, the only way you're going to be reintegrated back into society is if you do the following: you make amends, you pay some restitution, uh, you show that you've been rehabilitated, whatever. <clears throat> and if you don't," You're going to be completely ostracized by society. Okay. Now, one of the conditions of being reintegrated back into society might be look, unless you have a lot of money, which most guys wouldn't, you need to go to this work camp for five years and you need to put your head down, stay out of trouble, prove that you're a good citizen, prove you're improving yourself and earn some money paying back the victims and apologizing. So you could have private institutions running these work camps, which are not like slave camps because the people can leave. It's just that if they they leave, they're violating the conditions of their parole, so to speak, 
and they're going to be ostracized from society. And it, and I could imagine a very tight, well-functioning set of ostracism rules that mean that you better – I mean you're basically going to starve to death because you're not going to get insurance. No one's going to deal with you. You can't live in this neighborhood. You're going to be relegated to utter poverty and outcast from everything. And well, so a, I, I could see them agreeing on that voluntary penalty to – sign up for these so-called prisons or work camps for a while i could see that well, well this is an important point i think because i mean i've i as you know i've made the point that that, that i think the, the non-aggression principles law would have to be enforced with this kind of standard of reasonable certainty because if yeah. you use force against people when you're not certain they deserve it then you're criminally reckless yourself and potentially violating their rights um but when people come back at me with that well then that means that you know we've got nothing for the gray areas and we've got no way of enforcing that i would come back to them with exactly what you said actually we do have plenty of things we can do yeah. when we can't use violence we can still use yeah. because as you say we're not obliged to interact with people and have them be part of our society and have them be part of our organizations right. and trade with them and all these other things that they would want there's plenty of things that we can do that are still peaceful that aren't violating their rights that aren't violating their freedom but still are very very powerful tools for pushing people in the directions that we want them to go with regards to these higher standards that i think there has to in civilization and society there has to ultimately be just like for contracts there has to be uh, an implicit recognition of uh, a good a good faith presupposition on the part of the parties, right? To fill in gap fillers and things like that. There has to be on the part of people in society a willingness to uh, negotiate and a willingness to submit in the end in intractable disputes. There has to be a willingness to submit your disputes to a third party and to accept the results, even if you don't agree. There has to be that sort of Willingness, which means that, like, let's say two neighbors have a, a reasonable dispute over a contract or property or money or the boundary line between their tracks. Um, the only way to solve it is to have outright violence and war, or they have to resort to a peaceful process, right? They can negotiate with each other. If they can't come to an agreement, they have to go to a third party. And if the third party rules in favor of A and not B, even if B knows in his heart he was wronged, he has to accept it because that's the price of being in society because there's there's nothing else you can do because we're not omnipotent right we're not i'm sorry we're not omniscient we, we can make mistakes uh we're not infallible i should say um so given that you want to live in society with each other you have to have a willingness to negotiate and to compromise and to let third parties settle disputes which is why i think that this vigilante justice would tend to be um frowned upon because it would it would display an unwillingness to go to the the normal channels everyone else goes to. I mean, you well, can get away with it on occasion, but yeah. And that's why I think more institutional, if you like, arrangements for 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 NAP enforcement may actually be more viable in that sense because yeah. because the vigilante justice person is is far more at risk of of making himself guilty of a crime than the organization that has the necessary yeah. training and, and, and he necessary... and you won't and you won't have as much of an excuse to say i had to resort to vigilante justice because i had no other way of dealing with it if, if there is an institutional mechanism that works reasonably well most of the time and that's all you can expect in a reasonably functioning society then if you don't resort to i mean then you you have less of a complaint that i had to go do it on my own because there's no there's no alternative like though there is an alternative yeah, and it's yeah. the best we can do. So you need to rely upon that. Yeah. And although the right for you to act yourself as a vigilante would still technically be there, the Correct. risk of you going beyond what you have the right to do would be very high. So it would be a risky venture for, yeah. for people and the penalty. to do. So there would there would be there would be social penalties yeah. to pay for doing that. For I mean, the law has always said that there's a you know, there's a price to be paid in general or the it's frowned upon to be a judge in your own case uh, yeah. or to take or to, to take the law into your own hands. Now, there's been exceptions made for self-defense in an immediate situation of peril. When you can't wait for the police to arrive, you have the right to use force to defend yourself, but, and you have to make decisions on your own. And everyone understands, well, in that case – but if you can call the cops or you can go to the law, you can take someone to a court, 
you don't go just you don't enforce the law because you people tend to be biased in their own favor if nothing else right well and also i think you're doing when you go through these uh, more formalized processes of trials and, and, and evidence and, and proving your case and stuff like that I think the argument that the the vulnerability of you or of you being um, liable to some kind of criminal um, uh, process because you've done some sort of violation is lessened because you've got all of these other things in place you know like like let's say if you were just a vigilante you didn't have that training you didn't have all of these things like whereas if you have an organization that's doing these things making the taking these steps to make sure they've got that reasonable certainty which and that's why i say reasonable certainty because we can never have absolute certainty that's why we have that it's there's there's an except like like and that's another point i think is important that i, I like to make and i think is worth mentioning <laughs> here is there's because a lot of people will point out, well, you know, no one can, you know, people are always going to disagree and there's always subjectivity and we can't, we cannot escape that completely. But what we can still have is that reasonable certainty that because it's like we can't be the judge in our own case. Others are going to judge us. But if they're going to do so, they have to employ reasonable certainty because they don't I, have some yeah. divine right over us. I think your concept of reasonable certainty, I'm not so sure I would use it to replace the legal standards. I think that your concept of reasonable certainty makes more sense. When we're talking philosophically about what we know is right and wrong and what the principles are. In other words, we have reasonable certainty that this is how property rights work. This is how they should be allocated. This is what contract rights are. Uh, but within the legal system that emerges based upon the principles we have reasonable certainty in, you could say if you want to – have capital punishment and actually execute someone you need to have you need to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt uh if you want to have a property settlement like determine who owns this piece of property in a civil case uh preponderance of the evidence might be enough so you could have different standards of legal proof in the system that everyone agrees is a reasonable have reasonable certainty is a reasonable way to do things. If you follow Sorry, me, go back to that last point. What, when when would when would preponderance of evidence be? Okay? So in the legal system right now, the way it works is, uh, I think this is kind of in the common law too. But in the U.S., in the U.S., there's at least three standards of proof. Burden of proof is who has the burden of proving something. Standard of proof is how high it has to be. So typically in criminal cases, you have to have a jury trial has to be unanimous, 12 jurors. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but that's generally how it works. And they have to be persuaded beyond a reasonable doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt, which you could think of as 99% certainty. That's how we think of that, okay? Because you're, you're going to impose a, uh, an inflict physical punishment on someone, like put yeah. them in jail, in prison. Um, but if it's a civil case in the, in the current law um, where – the question is who owns this piece of property who owns this car um who owes who money in the contract the the burden is always preponderance which means more likely than not because if two people both contest a resource if there's a resource and a and b both claim they own it who do you assign it to you have to have some standard of proof and you can't make it the problem with making it beyond a reasonable doubt is that um, you still have a burden of proof. So typically the burden of proof is the possessor is presumed to be the owner. So whoever's possessing it currently is presumed to be the owner, and the other guy that's not possessing it has the burden of proof to prove that he really owns it. But should he have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt or just preponderance? Like is it more if, – if he can prove that it's more likely than not that he owns it, shouldn't he get it? Because from the no, outside – I don't think he should. Well, that's a – I just think that's debatable because the law has gone that direction for centuries for a reason. But I think that's right. I think that's I, I think that's a failing on the law. I mean, this is kind of connected to my problem with the civil criminal law distinction, because, like, for example, if I understand what you're saying, like in a criminal case, we're going to use force against this person. We need to be reasonably certain. But if we're going to enforce property rights, don't we need to be equally be reasonable certain because we could be potentially robbing somebody. And yeah. You know what yeah. you know. You know what I mean. Like, like the reason why I don't see a distinction between civil and criminal, and because if if it's an actual crime, if it's an actual net violation, then we are justified in a proportionate right. action. You know, in response. Now, if the severity of the crime will obviously dictate the severity of the 
or sorry, the proportionality of what we can do in response. So there was obviously a difference between, say, for example, rape and murder that, and than just stealing someone's car. But the fact of the matter is, is or who owns this house or whatever. But in all of those situations, we are potentially violating somebody if we make the wrong decision. We are you, yes. we are aggressing against somebody if we make the wrong decision. So in all of those scenarios, it would be criminally reckless, reckless of us to just just see what i'm just see what yeah, i'm saying i know i but but you're it's still like you're trying to split the baby by saying reasonable certain so uh, by your reasoning we should just use beyond a reasonable doubt for everything but i think you sense that that would be a problem so you're trying to go in between with well, this no, reasonable saying, well no 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 I'm, I'm saying beyond a reasonable doubt with everything that's that's a nap violation that's criminal because <coughs> well what i'm what i'm saying is is the argument for why we should do it for what's recognized today as criminal like murders and rapes and stuff like that that argument holds equally true for the lower level crimes and that violations that are currently classed as civil as long as they are actually crimes and that violations where we have that right to to act but if we have that right to act because the thing is is whether or not we have that right to act is is if we don't have that right to act then we're the we're the criminals you know we're no, the ones I, that are committing I, I agree with you and i think that you notice in what uh, what i said earlier i'm i'm saying a civil and a criminal so i'm already going on the state's bifurcation sure. of them and i kind of agree we should have only one but if you go back to the contract thing we were talking about earlier the contract is not itself enforceable but it 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 helps us prove who owns what so once you know who owns what then you could say you have to have a very high standard of proof to prove that 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 right was violated, okay? Because you want to use force against someone to punish them or to, re to respond against them. But it's not so clear to me that the initial determination of who owns what itself is the same standard. Like the to prove to prove who the contract. Well, let me give you a simple example. Let's suppose, uh, you know, there's. I don't know, a valuable, I'm trying to think of a valuable item, like a, a diamond. Let's say there's a diamond. And this pawn shop has it. And two guys, A and B, both claim that they own the diamond. Okay? So the, the legal system has to, has to answer the question, does A own it or does B own it? Okay, and the pawn shop admits we don't own it. We're, we're going to give it over to whoever owns it. I don't know. Someone deposited it with them, like in you know they said someone owns it, and A and B both claim to be that person. You can't have a, a the standard can't be beyond a reasonable doubt because then you wouldn't give it to either one. So like both they both just they both have a claim. So yeah. the only thing you can do is give it to the one that has the better claim, and the better claim means preponderance i think i'm not sure about this by the way i'm i'm, I'm trying to extrapolate a little bit about how a yeah. private legal system would develop based upon knowing what did happen in reality but i i could imagine in some cases the best you can do is give it to the person who has the better claim to it but better doesn't mean 99 percent. it just means 51 percent. do you follow me yeah but okay I'm, yeah to I determine who saying. owns it and I'm then still... once you determine who owns it then you can use the higher standard of proof to prove a rights violation. But I don't know. I'm not sure about this, to be honest. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm to be honest, I'm still leaning in my original position of saying that I think you need that beyond reasonable because any step of the way, I, I mean, I, I must admit, the example you gave makes it a little, makes it <laughs> like not quite so black and white in my head. Uh, with that assertion but it seems to me that any step of the way if you're not reasonably because the thing is is i suppose if if i'm trying to think of like in this pawn shop scenario if neither party can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they own it then for me it's, I just, un I, it's unowned and subject it's to unowned yeah i mean subject it's to rehomestead no that's what that's one answer so that means the pawn shop guy owns it because he's in possession of it so he's the one who instantly rehomesteads it um I'd go along with that because in the day, if I found something um, and somebody said, oh, well, that's mine, if they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it is, I don't see why I should have to give it to well, you. Well, but, but 
I, I could probably preponderance think of seems too low. I know, I know beyond reasonable doubt seems ridiculously high. I could, I could think of a better example if I was given time, but you, you could imagine the way this works in, in property title is so let's say um, two people contest the ownership of an estate of land like Blackacre, um, some, some tract of land in a, in, a, in, a, in a castle or whatever's on it. Um, now, according to our, our property theory, um, I think we should wrap up in a minute too. After yeah, we sure. This. Um, yeah. We, we determine who owns it by original homestead, like who owned it first, and then how was it assigned by contract over the generations? So that's how we figure it out. But typically, if A and B both claim to own this land, <clears throat> if they both agree that 100 years ago, uh, some person C owned it, they both agree that C owned it. C might not have owned it or C might have stolen it, but they both agree C owned it. So they both claim to trace their title to C, like C left it in a will to one of A's ancestors and C left it in another will to one of B's ancestors. But so they're conflicting. So the law has to determine which one really has the better title to it. So the question is always better title between A and B. We know one of them owns it because C owned it. No one else has a better claim to it. So either A or B owns it. So we have to give it to one of them. So that means between them, whichever one has the better claim. If you put, if you say that, that each one has to prove it by ninety nine percent, you could end up in a situation where A and neither A nor B can prove it, and so it's unowned, even though we know that one of A and B owns it. You follow me? Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Although I will say this: that even if I accepted that, which I'm potentially could, because I can, I, I'm, I can see, what, I can see the logic in what you're saying there, but. I still think I can still hold my position with regards to violations, civil yeah. or criminal, because in that situation, there's, there's, it, it's, you're not, you're not aggressing against somebody. You're not like, no, no, like no. they haven't, no, no. they haven't no, proven I, it. Sorry, go on. I know, but that's what I'm saying. So I'm saying there's two stages. So, so, so the civil case could say, okay, A owns it because he has a better title than the other one, but now B tries to use it. <laughs> And so we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he's committing aggression against A's property, but A has a title to it because of the preponderance standard. Do you see how like they could – now, by the way, I, I just thought of one solution that could lend support to your side. You could say that, okay, in the case where A and B can't definitively prove it's theirs, then the law gives it to A and B together. And then if they can't come to an agreement, they have to sell it and split the proceeds. You could do that. Maybe, maybe there's a way. Maybe there's a way to respect this this high standard of proof. Uh, I don't know. I just don't know if we can determine that from our armchairs. All I'm saying is I think that your standard of reasonable certainty is more what applies to us thinking about what the principles are. I'm not sure if it would be the same as the standard that we would apply in a real world legal system that everyone agrees is the practical way to apply these principles to to settle disputes. But yeah, but I, I, I agree with that. But then the way I conceptualize that is these higher standards that we would want to apply where we have, well, I say higher standards, where we're applying lower standards of proof and stuff like that, they would be part of agree, agreed upon um, collective. So for example, maybe, maybe you yeah. know, like say you're part of a regulated market or you're yeah. part of some kind of society where you agree to have yeah. preponderance decide it, it, things. It, it could be that the, that the contracts, the insurance provisions, the arbitral tribunals, all tend to evolve down to a system of workable rules that use preponderance sometimes. And that's as a practical matter, what you have to agree to, to be part of that system. Yeah. yeah like that would that. only apply with consent. And then what you would say is then all scenarios where you don't have those agreed upon relationships, where you've just got say two random people yeah. that have no Out -out situations. Other, yeah. Yeah. Then you have to go back to reasonable certainty. Could be, could be isolated or ad hoc or outlaw situations. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Yeah, could be. Okay. Well, you've given me. Uh, I, we should probably wrap up because it's nearly two hours. Uh, that's actually flown by. <laughs> um, you've given me a massive amount of food for four, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me because I, I view these conversations as like I think I like to think these ideas obviously in my own head, um, but when I having conversations with other people like yourself, I feel like I'm kind of borrowing a bit of your brain power to think collectively a little bit and, and you know, like, and, and, and to come at it from angles that I haven't thought of myself. And it really yep. helps me polish these ideas and get a better understanding of them. So I, uh, I really, here. really appreciate yep, me that. Me too. Me too. That's what's useful about this because there's not many people like us that think, think of these, you can't have normal, you can't have conversations like this with normal people usually. So 
Up, oh, you just passed. No, on. well, and one point that was made to me is like not everybody obviously wants to pick into this level of detail. Yeah, not everybody <laughs> has to. You know, like you can still put it to people simply of the you know you own yourself, don't aggress against others. That's still nice and simple. Yeah, but when people, if people do want to pick apart the finer details, it's yeah. nice to have this clear understanding of the foundation yeah. and how the principle works underneath it, so that we can navigate the these less obvious more sophisticated situations which you know inevitably come up i agree all right enjoyed it uh we'll do it again sometime i look forward to it thank you very much Stefan. take care matt